Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm delighted to introduce this virtual event with Sandy Tan, presenting her new novel, Lurkers, in conversation with Kevin Kwan. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. We're hosting events every weeknight right here on Zoom. And just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com, where you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase lurkers on harvard.com, as well as the link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past very long year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm honored to introduce our speakers. Sandy Tan is the acclaimed director of the Netflix film Shirkers, which won a directing award at the Sundance Film Festival, was named Best Documentary by the Los Angeles Film Critics Association, and was shortlisted for the Oscar for Best Documentary. She's also the author of a previous novel, The Black Isle. She's lived in Los Angeles for 20 years, but everyone still thinks she lives in New York. Joining her in conversation tonight is Kevin Kwan, the author of Crazy Rich Asians, the international best novel that has been translated into more than 30 languages. Its sequel, China Rich Girlfriend, was released in 2015, and Rich People Problems, the final book in the trilogy, followed in 2017. For several weeks in 2018, the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy commanded the top three positions of the New York, New York Times bestseller list, an almost unprecedented single author trifecta, and the film adaptation of Crazy Rich Asians became Hollywood's highest grossing romantic comedy in over a decade. In 2018, Kevin was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Tonight, they'll be discussing Sandy's latest novel, a kaleidoscopic portrait of neighbors on a California street. While they try to keep to themselves, their personal catastrophes, griefs, and desires push them towards moments of poignant, darkly funny collision. GQ says, Lurkers affirms Tan as a deft and impressively rangy storyteller with an unfettered imagination, eager to flay open the more disturbing aspects of human nature and suffering. And Justin Kritzky says, Sandy Tan somehow manages to perfectly capture the twisted, infuriating, beautiful soul of Southern California in the mid aughts with all its seemingly irreconcilable contradictions. The fictional inhabitants of Santa Claus Lane are so well wrought that you find yourself convinced that if you just drove around long enough, you might find them hanging out in a living room or a liquor store just outside of LA. Now I'm so excited to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Sandy and Kevin. Thank you. Um, thanks for having us. I am now trying to, okay, now I have this in gallery view, so it's, it's, uh, it's less horrible to just see myself on the screen. Huge. Thanks for having us. Um, Kevin, I think you may be on mute. Are you on mute? I don't believe oh, I'm on mute. Okay. Can you okay. Hear me? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you. Great. And now it's like, <laughs> again, we're stuck in this vacuum by ourselves and with strangers listening in. Um, well, so we will pretend they don't exist and we can talk about. We're just going to have a fun, happy hour. How's that? Yes. So thanks cheers. For, th thanks for being with us on the Friday evening, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you all for being here. And we will hopefully make this um, just really fun, relaxed night of really kind of getting to know. I want to get to know more about you and your book, quite frankly, because I, I feel like whenever we're together, we don't actually have time to delve into the life and times of Sandy Ton. So <laughs> I really want to kind of go there to start with. Okay. And I guess my first most important question is, why didn't you go to Harvard? Um. I didn't go to Harvard because my family knew that if I went to university in the US, um, I would never come home <laughs> and they would be right. No, no, but also I just, it never occurred to me to, yeah. to apply there. But had I gone to Harvard, I think I would be, I wouldn't be here right now. I would be out curing cancer. No, actually 
would be I would be I would be playing pinball because I would have invented a company like WeWork, sold it for a zillion dollars, and then have all the time in the world to play pinball. But really, actually, I think if I had gone to Harvard, um, I would be me, the same, because everything would cancel itself out, and all my, you know, my all my horrible bad impulses would counteract all the good that maybe going to Harvard does to you or all the bad. Um, and then I would be left st sitting here and having to um, flog my book in a, in a virtual bookstore situation. You, we would have to reset the matrix, you know, for that. But what about you? Why didn't you go to Harvard? Um, I was just way too stupid. I would never have gotten in. Basically, I mean that's that's the god awful truth. I bet I, you didn't even try, but you 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 were an artistic guy, so you went to to Parsons, right? I that was my second degree. My first degree was um, I went to University of Houston, and I started literature and creative writing there. Um, you know, once again, also because of a confluence of influences, I was very young. I graduated from high school at sixteen, and so I think my parents didn't want me to go too far away. Number one, number two. I really, at that point, was not academically oriented at all, you know? Um, yeah. you know, I think I had this dream, like my dream was, oh, you know, like the dream was art school. It was never really about going to like a serious academic institution. Um, but going to the University of Houston, I actually found my academic side. Wow. Um, so it was, it was kind of interesting, but yeah, you know, if I had to redo it all over again, um, I think I would have, would have liked to have gone, you know, to Oxford. Right. So like Balliol College, you know, or Oriel or one of those, you know, kind of posh schools, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I was I was fearing going to one of those posh schools. Um, yeah. I, had, I had, OK, so I'll just brag and say that I had perfect A levels. I might have could have wow. gone to those kinds of places, but I yeah. I didn't um, because I just didn't want to be stuck studying Chaucer when I could have been spending 20 hours straight in the movie theater watching Twin Peaks, a Twin Peaks marathon. And that was what I was interested in at that point, which is really stupid, but this is what I wanted to do. Uh, and I wanted to squander my times, my time in the movie theater rather than mm -hmm. reading books. Um, and I'm, I'm just way too, I don't know, it's just, again, a late developer, anyway. Would you have ever called yourself a bookworm? Um, I read, but I read weirdly. I mean, I would read things like the Klaus Kinski memoir, Kinski Uncut. I mean, I would read Jersey Kaczynski. I mean, I would read um, Bruce Chatwin. I mean, things, I, I don't know. I mean, those were my, my kind of books mm -hmm. that I just got to classics really late. So I was such a late bloomer that um, I read Moby Dick, maybe my 30s. And it was my favorite I, book. I in think world. that's, I mean, that's the best time to read it, really. I think Moby, yeah. you know, a lot of Melville, I think, is is read far too early. Yeah. Um, it's wasted people. on the young, maybe. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I feel the same way actually about To Kill a Mockingbird, believe mm -hmm. it or not, you know, Harper yeah. Lee's book. I feel like because it's, to me, it's such a beautiful distillation of coming of age. When you're a teenager, you're in the middle of it. You can't see it, <laughs> you know, from the rearview mirror. Um, yeah. So I remember reading, for example, To Kill a Mockingbird when I was a teenager and just kind of like, oh my God, this is some horrible classroom assignment. And then in my 20s, rereading it and just rediscovering a whole other book, you know, altogether. Yeah. And I feel that's, that's, you know, the same case with Melville and a lot of great writers. You know, you just, yeah. you just have to be in a different phase in life to, to, see, to appreciate it. Um, and same with movies, actually, I would have to say. You know, yeah. watching Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love when you're like a teenager is very different than when you're in your thirties and you've, you know, had heartbreak. Right. <laughs> many times over, you know what I mean? So let me ask you, do you think, I mean, so you, you were a late bloomer when it came to a lot of the classical texts, a lot of the great fiction. And I stuff was like that. a late bloomer regarding everything, I think. But not with movies. But um, not with movies. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 I watched film, right? them, but I don't necessarily, I mean, maybe I didn't get them. But, you know, yeah, I badged my way into the Singapore Film Society when I was a kid just because I wanted to see Rebel Without a Cause. I mean, it's, it's not like I was going for the primo, primo classic, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't going, well, and Fellini, but I wasn't going for like, you know, the, the super highfalutin Antonioni or anything. You weren't I, watching Tarkovsky at, at age 13? 
I was, but I did not see? appreciate see? it. I... No, but I mean, watching is different yeah. than, I mean, you can be totally. just yeah. watching. Yeah, anyway. Interesting. So let me, I just want to quickly rewind now that I've gotten a little sense of, you know, your cinematic and, and sort of literary past. Um, let's go to something a little more present. Um, Shirkers. You know, yes. I remember the last time I saw you physically was at the premiere of Shirkers in LA. And thank then, you for doing that. I, I yeah, every few I years mean, I have to find an excuse to see you and then I <laughs> call you and harangue you into doing one of these things with me. And, and it was that was fun because I made was, you cry. And I will never forget that I made you cry. <laughs> To, to, to clarify, her film made me cry. I was so touched by the genius and the beauty of the film in the same way that I am touched by the genius and the beauty of the book you've written. So first of all, congratulations on Lurkers. It Thank is a you. marvelous achievement. I mean, it really, it got me through such, you know, a tough little spell last year when I first read it, you know, in the, in the midst of sort of the terror of all that, what we were all going through. So I, I really appreciated that. And it just really made me wonder like, you know, I, I saw you at Shirkers and then you went on this big tour promoting the movie. It had just come out. You were doing all this stuff for Netflix. Yeah, but talk about big tour. I mean, you were like doing all kinds of big tours. Yeah, well, don't try to turn this back on me. We're talking okay. about you, so. All right. <laughs> so, okay. but you know, you were very busy and then you had all these movie offers. You were developing all this stuff. And suddenly you call me up and you say, I've written a book. You know, I'd love to send you a copy. And it's like, we, first of all, where did you have find the time to write this book? you know, in the um, midst all the whirlwind of success and amazing stuff that was happening with your film career. Because all of those things involve other people and things that involve other people either do not come to fruition or they take forever. And you just want to have, I mean, there's nothing like you and your computer fighting with yourself. I mean, you have complete control over that and somehow you will find the energy to finish something that will lead to something, um, you know, like a book. I mean, it's just the most low tech um, form of storytelling I can think of. It's just you fighting with yourself, uh, you and your computer. And then once it's done, you email it to your friend, which is what I did. I emailed it to my friend at Soho Press, thank God, um, Mark Dalton, hello, <laughs> my editor, who said, okay, and that was it. Um, you know, I, I, I had a previous book that, you know, um, uh, with a big publisher and um, in 2012. That's, we're and, talking about the Black Isle. Yeah, the yeah. Black Isle. And I published it with a big house and, um, you know, I, it didn't land properly. And I just wanted something, you know, I just wanted to to maybe, um, you know, I talked to Mark about this thing. He knew I was working on this book, mm -hmm. Clerkers, that turned out to be Lurkers. And um, he said, can I see it? Like one day, I think he came to a screening of-, of, of Did Shirkers. you say it was called Clerkers? Lurkers. Lurkers, yeah. Oh, Lurkers, did you sorry. say there was and another title? No, 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 or, no, no, no. Okay. no, no. It, had, it had a different working title, but, um, yeah. but he saw me at a screening of Shirkers in um, Brooklyn when I was doing, it was a BAM, you know, uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then he said, "Oh, what about that book you were working on?" And yeah, you know, I knew he was at Soho Press. And um, I said, "Okay, um, you, you still remember it, and you still have seen bits of it, and it seemed funny and interesting, and why not work on it?" And so I, while I was doing the whole Shirkers stuff, um, I just wanted to come back to something that was mine, um, <laughs> that I could work on and maybe finish once and for all. And um, frankly, it was during the um, starting days of this pandemic that really made me finish this thing and that's when I put in the true finishing touches mm -hmm. to this this book and then um and then that's why it's in your hands and in stores um so and, this book I mean it seems like this book had been gestating for quite a long it is time. yeah it had been gestating for a long time I began this book um in like the mid um like I don't know 20 or five or 20, just a few years after 9-11. So it was me kind of getting acquainted with this neighborhood. I moved into um, kind of in North Pasadena in California, um, just outside of LA, Northeast LA uh, of LA. It's, uh, you know, the foothills of the San Gabriel mountains. And um, it was me just kind of getting to know this, this very suburban neighborhood that looked so familiar. It's built with these beautiful craftsman, craftsman houses. 
Um, and they look so familiar to me because I'd seen all a lot of these houses before and these streets before in movies and TV. When I was growing up in Singapore watching, you know, American TV or movies, I mean, Buffy the Vampire Slayer's house, the Halloween house, I mean, all these things I'd seen in movies before, the father of the bright house. I mean, all these movies use these streets. And I thought, huh, that's a way of kind of, you know, imagining my way into, you know, these homes and just welcoming myself into this very slightly alienating place. Um, would be to kind of imagine imagine the lives of the inhabitants of these houses, and that's how it started, you know, forming. And also, that was during a few years after 9/11, when when there was this, still this kind of you know this this paranoid air. Even though we were on the other side of the country, mm -hmm. I you know wasn't in Manhattan when the Twin Towers were hit, but I saw it on TV live, and it, it still felt like a very strange, um, you know, this was the era in which people were starting to bray on TV, uh, like cable news, <laughs> bray from both sides. And it was it was not as noisy a braying as it is now, but it was starting to get that way. And I could feel it. And there was this very uncertain feeling in the air where they were, there was this paranoia that was being seated, uh, paranoia, you know, about neighbors, about people who just entered the neighborhood that you were not familiar with. And even I, I have to admit that I was one of the people who would look at people askance if they were driving at unnatural speeds on my street. And I would be the person standing on my porch, just looking at them. Um, and, and there was that, that, that feeling of, of, of mistrust and distrust between people who are just perfectly ordinary and, and imagine the worst from, about each other. And I just thought, why not try to capture some of that, but make it funny. <laughs> and so this thing uh, came about, it just kind of wrote itself as soon as I started to imagine myself into the lives of these various characters on this one street. And I should emphasize to our audience out there and, and the people who have not read this yet, this, this is such an incredibly funny, funny book. Um, I, I laughed my way, I mean, as, as serious as some of the topics are and as, you know, brilliant as some of the passages were, I laughed my way through the book. That was probably <laughs> primarily what happened, which was such a relief for me. That was, and, that was and as my you know, intention. When I, when I did your event, you know, we had another event, a sort of launch event for Sandy a week ago. Um, just remembering a passage, I went into a laughing fit for like five minutes and couldn't control myself. So mm -hmm. that's, that's how good this book is, people. Um, I'm going to go so. <laughs> look up that thing on YouTube and I'm going to you know, play it on a loop. You'll, that you'll do a meme was, out of it. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that um, was something. So you move to LA, you're, you're in this, on this beautiful street in Pasadena and you start sort of thinking about your neighborhood. Were the characters, because, you know, all these characters are, do live on this street. Were they actually inspired by individual real people that you had observed on this street or are they amalgams of, you know, your imagination and yourself and all these different things, or or did you actually do character studies of like the um, I, I the didn't the do character stuff like that. Just studies. I um, they all contain aspects of me. I guess the characters do. Um, one of the characters in particular is an aging um, horror writer, um, a gay man in his I guess fifty five or maybe sixties, um, and he's a he's an aging horror writer who's extremely vain and and kind of coming to terms with his frailties. Um, and that man actually was based on a famous writer, well, not based on, but some of the, the, the broad strokes of his um, sense of decor in his house mm. were, were partially inspired by a living, very famous novelist that I had the fortune of walking into the house of um, and, and seeing that all of his bookcases, pristine, um, very art directed bookcases, in a kind of film noir style, um, were all filled with his own books. Every single crevice was filled with um, his own books in the various, you know, editions from around the world. And, and the entire home was like a shrine to his, his brand. Um, maybe this is how most famous authors live. Maybe this is how you live, Kevin. I've never been it's to your home, but- Certainly, not. I don't even have a single copy of my book. <laughs> at my home can I just tell you it's always very embarrassing when people are like will you send me a copy and I was like I don't actually have my book so you know I can get my publisher to send you a copy but I don't I don't keep my books you know at home but yeah. that's that's so interesting um you know so you have a character like Raymond Vanderholt we just talked about him you know the yeah. aging gay horror novelist mm -hmm. and then you have Rosemary Muir Park 
you know, mm-hmm. two Korean Americans, um, you know, born in the USA, but from a Korean family who are teenagers, mm-hmm. you know, one is a younger teenager, I believe Mira is 13. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, and then Rosemary is like 15, 16. Mm-hmm. You have Mary Sue Ireland, um, who is, um, has her own kind of fascinating biography as, as, as a woman, as an American woman, but who mm-hmm. ends up on this street and who ends up um, adopting a Vietnamese daughter yeah. from Vietnam, Kate. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to ask a very kind of stupid question that people ask me all the time, but I think yeah. it's actually meaningful to ask you. Yes. What made you decide to feature these Asian characters? Uh, just as a happenstance of... As a happenstance, see, um, we're in California. Cal- yeah. yeah, we're in yeah. California. Um, you know, we exist. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to, to, to show us and all I di- our mm-hmm. diversity and and different kinds of people that we are. We're not just one block. Um, mm-hmm. But also, I mean, I just wanted to li- write lively um, mm-hmm. Asian people as I know them to be um, and want them to be represented in, in, in fiction um, and in, you know, in, in media. Um, but I just, I just wanted to, to have some fun, you know, with, mm-hmm. with, with characters I thought I could um, uh, realistically inhabit somehow, you know? Um, and also because I also wanted to write about, I just thought it would be fun to write mm-hmm. these people and, um, and also to set a scene in, in, um, in Vietnam <laughs> just because yeah. I'd been there and I just wanted to write it, you know, how, how things are. Yeah, well, it is very fun and it is very intense. And I have to say, I, to me, I really admire that because like, I always feel like I can't write about people and cultures that I'm not familiar with, you know? So mm-hmm. f- for you, you know, I know you come from Singapore. I don't know how much experience you have with the Korean culture or the Vietnamese culture, but I, I feel like you really were able to so incisively, you know, get into the psyche of, of these characters and like this little very kind of, afraid Korean family, for example, like that, that, that was sort of one of the things that, that really resonated to me, like what sort of meek lives yeah. the parents had, you know, that first generation yeah. um, of, of, of immigrants and, and how, what gulf there is really between these two parents who came from Korea and their very Americanized children. You know, I just felt that was so beautifully wrought yeah so it was my way of trying you know. to understand them i it was my way of trying i mean you know as you know i guess maybe because i'm so socially in that like when i try to like mm-hmm. try to understand people i try to write my way into understanding them or you know you kind of figuring it out by for yourself as a thought experiment but also as a i don't know a humanist mission or something um but you know mainly you're just trying to figure it out and try to you know trying to have fun with it, um, yeah, it's 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 funny um, that I I don't know it's it's funny I, I was I was saying to you the other day um, about how um, family I mean because it's, it's, a lot of this is about family um, the, the 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 stories like in family this dynamics book all, family yeah. dynamics family different dynamics, kinds yeah. of family dynamics um, that you can be de- be devout uh, be bedeviled by your father your aged mm-hmm. father who's calling you on your phone and even though he's not there he, he can feel very present and and very domineering and but you you can also feel much closer to a parent who um you know it's an adoptive parent rather than a, a blood relative and sometimes blood relatives might feel like the most foreign people you know even though <laughs> You're, you know, you know, and, and we're very, I, I wouldn't know anything about that, Sandy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nor would I. I mean, I, I and, and, and we, we, we talk about this all the time between ourselves and in, in some, in we're, some we're respects, we're, we're still talking that. about this uh, between ourselves because no one's really listening, are they? Um, but, but I, the other, just, just the other day, I was telling you that my, my father wrote me an email um, about, you know, because whenever you only hear really from your relatives, once you something you produce gets out into the world and it's usually to complain about how, oh, it's not in the stores yet, or oh, it's so expensive, or um, why, you know, or, or <laughs> like, oh, that bad review you got, or you know, it's always things like that. So I have to credit my father for yeah. writing me an email that's about none of that. Um, I he says that he has bought a copy, I guess he bought it through Amazon or something, rather than you know, some store where he has to pay extra um, in, you know, to get a hard copy. 
And he said, um, congratulations. And I quote, because um, I, I will misquote if I don't read this. Um, congratulations for the lurkers. <laughs> um, I, I do not wish to read it as it would be like peering into your soul. That's what he says in that quote. And um, so I, I, I just was very, very happy. Strangely enough, very happy that he wrote yeah. that email because there, I had two takeaways. One was that he bought a coffee, which is very important. And then secondly, that he actually thinks I have a soul. Um, <laughs> so, so, so that's, that's my takeaway yeah. from that. And, you know, you and I know um, more than ever than, than, I mean, well, I guess we, we just know not to, to expect too much from relatives. Um, but but I'm, I'm very happy that he, he bought a copy. Um, and I'm also very relieved that he's not going to read it. Um, but at the same time, because he's not going to read it, he's not going to discover the, 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 the great surprise in the book that was actually placed there for him to discover, which is that um, one of the characters who's this Korean pastor, Mr. Park, is a secret short story writer um, of, of very um, interesting, shall we say, short stories. And those stories were actually inspired and sometimes taken verbatim from a stack of short stories that my father wrote and, and gave to me and handed to me and said, can you help me publish these things? Um, so he will, he will never figure that out and that will be okay by me. Well, he won't if, if, we, if none of us here tell him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, suddenly my lawyer mind came on and I was like, oh, well, you know, let's, let's, let's pivot away from that. So yeah, actually, has, that, this, we should censor, we should cut this yeah. part out because it's- uh, He hasn't read know, The Black Isle? Him. Like, you don't think your family has no, read no, The Black No, no, he didn't read The Black Isle because okay. he, he actually said, he said that one very smart thing. He says, oh, it is, um, it, it is, oh no, he didn't say The Simpsons. I wish he would say The Simpsons, but it wasn't. He said, it's, it's Harry Potter meets James Clavell, which I thought was, okay. I'll, I'll take that. Hmm. Interesting. But it's, um, it's for those of you who haven't read it, The Black Isle is another fantastic book of Sandy's. It, it was her debut novel, very different from Lurker's, completely different. It's an it's sort of epic historical saga. And, um, and I have to thank yeah. the Harvard Bookstore for not being too snobby to, to stock it because they did stock it. I had friends who sent me pictures from the Harvard Bookstore um, where they saw it being sold unlike some snobby stores in LA that refused to stock it. I mean, it was, you know, and it was an excellent book that I feel perhaps was handicapped by its cover design in America. Uh, yes, thank you. Know, you. Because, Exotic Asian lady yeah, on the there's cover. There's a hoochie mama on the cover. Which yeah. Just, I, don't under, I don't even know who that is. I don't even know who that would be in that book, <laughs> you know, because I feel like it's such a wildly ambitious book and a dissection of a certain island, you know, that, that may or may Yeah, have. that we both know very so, well. But that was yeah. 19, uh, no, no, that was 2012. And I'm thankful and optimistic that the world has, has kind of advanced or publishing or whatever has advanced since 2012 where that kind of book would get that kind of cover mm -hmm. and that kind of, um, you know, marketing treatment. Um, and, and then you came along in 2013 with Crazy Rich Asians and just, change the landscape. And thank you for that, because it now means that maybe if one writes that kind of book, you don't necessarily have to have the 2012 cover <laughs> with a hoochie mama on the cover. I mean, you say this, but I have to tell you, I have to confess, I initially really, really kind of was appalled by the cover of my own book, okay. you know, because First of all, it was never supposed oh, to be Oh, the blingy called. one. The blingy yeah, the bl one? Well, both the, both the blingy one and the one that's become iconic with the woman's face. Right. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. felt like I, yeah, I felt like it didn't represent my book well. You know, right. like I wanted, a, I wanted a case. very, it's like, always, it's, it's always like, how much did they not represent? Like, how badly did they not represent it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was my initial reaction. Cause I wanted, you know, coming from graphic design, I wanted a very sort of Carol Carson Devine kind of cover, you know, very intellectual you know, or very chip kid, something very clever. And, you know, they pivoted to something. Obviously that was you're just, wrong because they I was wrong. Like I was wrong. I know. Okay. I stand corrected. I have come to love the way they look. I love your and, covers, um, by the way. Yeah. But there is a snobbishness in bookstores yeah. about, you know, just because there's a woman on the cover with jewels, they think, oh, you know, this is trash fiction or whatever, you know, yeah. some bookstores that is. Yeah. You know, so it's it's mm -hmm. interesting, you know, the psychology of, of mm -hmm. book cover design and perception. 
yes. basically based on yes. just you know judge literally judging a book by its cover oh right quite frankly, yeah all these you know. hip bookstores in brooklyn say yeah <laughs> they want all type I mean, covers no and not, no not colors yeah 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 it's it's uh that's why that's why i was so surprised when yeah. you know my friends uh showed me that the harvard store was was, was stocking my book because that's uh unusual move because i've been snubbed by these very hip bookstores in la <laughs> speaking of hip bookstores you posted i think it was maybe yesterday or the day before there was a photo photograph on instagram of your book next to a stack of marilyn robinson's books yeah but that's in montreal and, it doesn't count okay because they they, they they're they're literate there <laughs> well you know and you said well you said oh you know she's one of my literary heroes you yeah know? Mm -hmm. um and i was wondering who are some of your other literary heroes besides Marilyn? Like who who do you oh, love now? Um, yeah, I'll be embarrassed to say their names because they're so great. Um, okay, my favorite book in the world is Absalom, Absalom. Hmm. Um, Faulkner. Faulkner, and yeah. Then, um, and then my and we you you okay, if you haven't read it, you would get it too. There's something, there's something very there's something very old Singapore about it. Um, you know, you know something interesting that happened at my high school? Yeah. There was a backlash against Faulkner. I'm sure there is. I remember this because my best friend in 10th grade, you know, we were all, we had to find a book that we wanted to read, right? And so he wanted to read Sanctuary um, by William Faulkner. Yeah. And his, and I remember our English teacher wouldn't let him, you know? Yeah. And he had to get a special note from his parents wow. saying, we allow our child to read. <laughs> and, and this William was back then. This is yeah. back before this people were canceling 80, people. 86, yep. 87, like, you know. Yeah. And we were trying to figure out what is so offensive about this book, which is considered, you know, a great, a great work of his, you know. I don't know if you've read Sanctuary. Um, I have not read that one, yeah. but I um, know, can figure out why, maybe. I don't know. Apparently uh, there is a, there is a depiction of rape in the book. Yeah, yeah. And that was that was the main. So it's interesting. Um so Yeah. I so I I totally pivoted away from Faulkner and I chose F Scott Fitzgerald. Right. You know, he chose Sanctuary, I chose The Great Gatsby and Yeah. There the lines diverged, you know. Yeah. So and I yeah, and 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 then and then um all these people I I love I I came to quite late, I guess. Um, you know, Roberto Bolaño, I, I, 2666, uh, it's one of my favorite books, uh, even more than Savage Detectives, which I love. Um, and um, then, um, you know, we both love The Leopard, Lampedusa's mm -hmm. uh, The Leopard, um, Gato Pardo. Uh, Il Gato, Gato Pardo. Yes, and um, uh, what else? I, um, I don't know, I, I always get, I, my, my mind always, you know, becomes yeah, a blank totally. when I, when I, and of course, it's a like, very was, unfair question to ask. It's a very unfair question, but when I was Sorry. younger, like yeah. maybe when, you know, like much younger, uh, you know, the, the book that everybody loves and that I loved as well was Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. It was like one of the mind blowing books mm -hmm. by a female author that didn't, you know, didn't, didn't conform to, to some kind of expectation. I've never read that. I, I need to. Yeah. I need to. That's missing from my, you know. Yeah. Book. Yeah. And I, I haven't seen, read or revisited that book in a long time. So I, it would be interesting. I, I randomly opened a few pages uh, a few months ago because um, I was talking to, I think, my my interviewer, this uh, GQ interviewer of mine like a few months ago. And she, she found some old um, unpublished novel that Catherine Dunn had done. And she's, I think she's gonna be releasing that with FSG um, soon. And she's mm. writing the, the forward to that. And so I got interested in looking her up again and just reading little bits of Geek Love. And I was like, oh my God, this is like still, it doesn't age. It's so, it's so present. I think it, you know, it's such a classic in the best way. Do filmmakers or films inspire you when, when you're writing? Yeah, more than, I, I have to say more than even uh, fiction because reading because I know that I can never be as good as I want to be and need to be so I watch movies on TV um but I also think very you know visually I guess and in and, and the writing of of lurkers I was actually kind of very um watching long-form TV like um six feet under 
um, you know, the, the HBO series, that was, that gave me a lot of freedom about thinking about characters and expansion and expanding of worlds and going back and forth in time uh, that is permissible. Because I think when I was starting to write this book in like 2005, 2006, I think that was less of a common thing that people mm -hmm. were doing. And I think a lot of fiction has been very influenced by, by long form TV, you know, and you start to see, um, I'm not saying that Jennifer Egan's visit from the goon squad was influenced by tv but she was one of the ones that did um characters you know different chapters different characters different time frames and it loosened up i think fiction a lot at least um popular well you know fiction the kind of fiction that gets into mm -hmm. the kind of stories that we want to go to um so 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 that was that was something um i think i much love tv uh not a lot actually i i do you have that thing too but that when you're writing you try not to to read too much or watch too much and you try to Ab limit absolutely absolutely yeah i really have to be in my cave you know and i really don't I actively avoid some things where i feel like oh i might be influenced by this so yeah. i really especially avoid it if there's even any sort of thematic hint same so, here same here i'm so glad i don't want, I I don't want to do that i'm such I, a know. nerd about process i, I yeah. want to hear like yeah what you do you just yeah. avoid any potential potential influence over that or absolutely or even like you know i'm, I'm now planning my next book right mm -hmm. so i'm i'm oh, even good. avoiding certain things because i don't want to be influenced in any way yeah you know is this, I wonder is, what that comes from. Is it? Is yeah. It, is, it is this book number two is in the Sex and Vanity, Vanity series? Yes. This is going to be the, this is going to be second book in the in the Sex and Vanity trilogy. Okay. So Excellent. like I'm already beginning beginning my you know research and immersion, but I'm it's interesting. I'm really avoiding anything that I think could be copycat in a way. I, I'm 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 exactly yeah. the same. But then when I'm editing, um, that's when you can you know read or watch good mm -hmm. things that my I, editing is different i think it's when yeah. i do a lot of my my best writing is when i'm editing i think mm -hmm. i don't know if that's your your method but i, I think I, I edit throughout i okay. edit throughout the process so i'm yeah. constantly you know writing and polishing yeah, yeah, going yeah, back yeah, and, and, yeah. and fixing stuff but in in your process like what is what is an average day like for you when you're writing a book or when you were writing lurkers like were you did you do you really are you disciplined i mean what's, um what's yeah your, when, when i'm writing um when i'm actually just the writing part the serious writing part um you 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 get very exhausted very quickly so you don't work for that many hours i mean you have like maybe five or six very very good hours maybe mm -hmm. if i'm being positive like five or six is very good and then and but when you're editing like which is more of the process i mean that over the last i don't know the final few months of it um i can edit for much longer periods like i can go for 11 hours or something and mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing um and i tend not to okay I, i'm just superstitious and i'm coward i don't want to um read or watch things that may not be good you know what i mean because mm -hmm. i'm very very worried about watching something that that i don't have a guarantee was going to be good because it might um um it's like it's like bad vibes you know you just don't want it to come in it's like i don't know it's it's, it's like inviting a bad ghost into your house mm -hmm. when you don't need to you know what i mean you know in a strange way i i do because i feel like this past year i've watched far fewer movies mm -hmm. and much more tv shows right but I feel there weren't like that many TV... good movies out this past year <laughs> yeah but i feel like in tv you're less committed to you know in a film it's this very distilled two hour long experience, right? And so much is packed in and you you are sort of entrapped, hopefully by this, by the vision of the filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, in TV, it's almost different. There's, it's, it's less fraught, it's more open. You can yeah. turn it on, you can turn it off, you can hit pause. Like I feel, maybe I'm very dogmatic, dogmatic when I, you know, I'm, I'm very committed to the cinematic experience and sitting through a whole movie without interruption, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it just takes a lot more to, to it's a much more of a sacrifice, I feel, you know, to like, you don't want to let this in unless you know it's going to be brilliant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, you know it's what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. What, cause, cause, cause um, my fear is the fear of allowing myself to know that I can be lazy or lousy and get away with it. You know, cause you've seen other people mm -hmm. get away with it. And, and, and there's a part of me that is maybe given to, 
um, you know, laziness or something, um, and then uh, slipshotness maybe. And and if I if I see that other people can do that, maybe I'll like just let go and just do that sometimes too. And I don't don't want to let myself do that because you know I'm I'm not good enough that I can let myself do that. You know what I mean? You know, I I think you. I think you underestimate how good you are, quite frankly. <laughs> First of all, do you consider you, yourself? Yeah, do you consider yourself more a writer than a filmmaker? Oh, uh, I mean, you you write for screenplays, you write novels, but then you you also you certainly get you know, to write more than you get to yeah. make films, only because economically and practically, um, you can write anywhere, anytime, and you can put it out there in the world, and mm -hmm. or email a manuscript to your friend at the publishing company um but you um but you 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 can't just say let's go shoot this movie i mean you can but i don't i mean because i don't want to shoot a movie my iphone um but you know what i mean it's it's just um I, I i think like a filmmaker i think um but i try to get the story out as in whatever way i can and in this case uh in terms of say the black isle and also the lurkers the printed word was the most efficient the most efficient mm -hmm. method of getting my story out into the world. Yeah. Um, Would you, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, 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 that's all I have to say. Would you ever consider directing a film or a TV version of Lurkers, for example? Or oh, do, yeah, do you, you would, sure. You would not, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, we're, I mean, I'm talking to some very good people and we're developing it. So <laughs> as, a, as a TV thing. Um, so we'll see what, that hap what yeah. happens with but that. But you wouldn't be too afraid to actually tackle the material yourself and, and direct no. it. Yeah. No, because I, I would know them in, you know, these people mm -hmm. intimately. And, 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 you know, if I, if I feel bold enough to be able to want to direct, or I'm planning, as you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. planning to um, direct my adaptation of Elif Batuman's The Idiot. Um, set in Arvid, so mm -hmm. Harvard Bookstore has is in my screenplay, and hopefully we can shoot there for one or two scenes, one of two you know important scenes, as it's an important location in the novel. Um, so yeah, if I if I feel like bold enough to feel like I can do that, I think I can hopefully tackle something as as silly as lurkers, the lurkers. <laughs> How did you get involved with the idiot? Can I ask? Um, I, I love the novel. It was, um, I love the novel because it doesn't lend itself immediately to, to a feature film adaptation. It's not structured like, you know, like some books are just like, okay, they're perfectly, you know, like a perfectly told story in the way of a feature, you, you're seeing the movie kind of as you're reading it. And this is not. Um, and that's when I thought um, it could, because the book is so great, but that it had, enough room to be a different version of its greatness but as you know it, it had it, you could there's space to distill it in a different form um as a movie and you tease out different elements and you structure it differently and um and 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 introduce it to more people maybe potentially um so and it, it's just such a, a such a great book and i was such a fan and i wrote her elif batuman um a letter saying that i was very interested in doing that and then I teamed up with um, a bunch of production companies and we went pursuing it and we, we got it. And, um, and she was a big fan of Shirkers and was, was, was confident that I could you know, bring something new to it. Um, and it's kind of, you know, like she, 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 I guess is wise enough to know that she's written the book uh, and she's also written the sequel to that that's coming out next year. Um, so she's, you know, kind of pretty confident in the world of her book as you know as the author of that that um she's kind of curious what i would you know come up with in the movie situation i guess i mean i i personally i would be interested in somebody taking my fictional works and also turning it into something else um who's not me so that you know you've already written the book so you want to see how somebody else sees it i mean it's just a that's a fun thing i think and I, i'm very thankful I, that she's um she's she's yeah. She has enough confidence in me to let me run with it a little bit. Well, that's going to be something else to look forward to. Um, so for the audience out there, mm -hmm. um, we're going to sort of pivot into a and a time. So if you have questions, please do ask them. And I will attempt to ask Sandy all the questions that she's 
um, she's going to be presented with. Um, but before we do that, I just, I guess I have one sort of last question for you, yeah. which is, um, what do you hope your readers would, would come away with after reading Lurkers? Um, you know, uh, one of the reasons I kind of started writing book was, was because I felt like LA was a very unknowable place. It's a very slippery place, hard to know different it's because it's so not just one thing it's so many different things and you only ever see one aspect of it um so I, I just I don't know I just hope that people don't necessarily need to know like they feel like they know LA but but that um but that they know different kinds of people a little more or maybe they're I don't know oh I could I have just, just I, I just I just hope that they have fun reading it really that's all and that's all I can hope for. Well, thank you. I think they certainly will if they haven't already. Um, so I'm gonna to go to the first question, which is from an anonymous attendee. How mysterious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> has your experience making Shirkers, and of course the experience behind the film, changed the way you think about constructing narrative in fiction and film? Um, yes, yeah, strangely enough. Um, um, sorry to be slightly inside baseball for, for people who may not have seen Jerkers or care, um, but it's a movie I made about a movie I made. Um, and and, and, and um, so to tell that story, I had to kind of play around with time and story a lot. And, um, you know, seeing that I was able to pull people along for Jerkers and, you know, make quite a complicated, slightly dark story that's set on multiple continents uh, over decades um, and have it seem to make sense uh, and people seem to like, gave me a lot of confidence really in, 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 in that once you have people emotionally, you have grabbed them emotionally, I feel like you can take them back and forth in time with you and um, kind of leapfrog around the world with you. And, you know, it's really um, very freeing and it was, it was a great confidence builder for me in, in terms of writing lurkers because I do that as well, as you know, um, leapfrogging in time. And um, it just made me feel like I could do that, you know, and, and not have to worry too much if, if um, I was paying attention to emotions first and emotion, I don't know, like that I would lead with that. And if people, you know, cared about these characters and, and, and understood what they were feeling, then you can sort of um, play around with time a little bit. And that was my, that was one of, one of the things I'm actually interested in doing um, in film as well as TV or, you know, books. Very cool. Yvonne Y asks, I'm an Asian American actress and novelist who's currently writing a novel set in Hong Kong as I'm a huge supporter of Asian talent and creating content for Asian talent. So for both Sandy and Kevin, do you feel that you're, that you want to collaborate with other Asians in projects and do you consciously set out to tell stories of Asian content? Why don't you go first? You go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go first so you can think about your answer. No, I'm not gonna think um, about it, oh, you go ahead. Yes, I absolutely do want to, you know, want to collaborate with, with other Asians and and I do you know I I feel that especially after um the success of Crazy Rich Asians the movie I mean it, it was very much an awakening for me to, to see how much hunger there was out there and how much how much talent there was out there that was so untapped and that really needed to be amplified so now you know my I spent all my time trying to <laughs> amplify and 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 work with with other talented Asian people on their projects um, and to create things together. Um, but I'm not exclusive to just the Asian world. I, you know, I collaborate with, with lots of people, whoever I, I think is, is doing interesting work. But I, I do feel a need to, to especially try to, you know, give voice and give help to, to Asian projects. And I would echo you exactly, um, except that I would say um, it would really depend on the project and depend on the people. I mean, you know, you, you don't just work with somebody because they're Asian. Um, I mean, I wouldn't. And, um, you know, I, 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 it's really interesting projects 
and 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 of course wanting to amplify people I think deserve to be amplified and people who are slightly whose stories have been neglected slightly. I mean, you know, I mean, if you if you read my book uh, and Kevin's books, of course, um, you know, they do feature Asian characters who aren't maybe necessarily the usual kinds that you have seen before. And <laughs> that's my my way of amplifying those stories. I don't want to do the same old, same old, same old, because I think, what's the point? You know, you have a thousand people trying to do the same old, same old, same old. So that's my uh, maybe not so uh, careful answering of that question. <laughs> Here's a question from Mark Doton. Hi, Sandy, you mentioned your love of Twin Peaks. Do you think any- That's my David, editor. <laughs> do you think Doton. any David Lynch influence has seeped into Lurkers? Oh, I certainly think so. Sorry, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess it, it, you know, when you're dealing with suburban stuff and, and, and it's like slightly surreal situations, precocious teenage girls, male predators, dark nights, white picket fences, you think Twin Peaks. Um, yeah, I mean, it is there. Uh, it's a very conscious attempt to kind of 21st century 21st century eyes, um, Twin Peaks or something. I mean, I, I wouldn't even think I would was do. Well, I'm not. I, I wouldn't say I would was tr trying to do a Twin Peaks thing because you can't. You know, this that's David Lynch's. But I, 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 I it was certainly um, an influence there a little bit because um, you cannot not you cannot not have Twin Peaks as your influence if you're doing um, a neighborhood. I think it just had such an influence on the culture, you know, yeah. in so many ways when it when it first came out. It it really seeped into film, into TV, into books. Like, you know, I think everyone was in some way either consciously or subconsciously influenced by it. Um, most people anyway, I think that that, you know, came of age, grew up in that era, watched Twin Peaks. Like, how could you not? It was so groundbreaking. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I frankly, yeah. for this book, I was more, um, you know, kind of in, um, inspired by um, Six Feet Under, you know, and it's kind of freeform way of telling, I mean, you have the anchor family um, of, you know, the undertakers, I guess, the funeral business, funeral mm -hmm. parlor business, and then you have people entering who, you know, who die and, and need their services in every single episode, so the world expands. And I like that that's the way they chose to, sh to show LA, you know, cause LA is so hard to know that this mm -hmm. was the lens through which you saw um, the city. And, um, and so that was, that for me was actually a greater influence than Twin Peaks, frankly. I'm gonna do a last call for questions. Okay. If, you, if you guys have your questions, please submit them. We're coming to, you know, the top of the hour. Mm -hmm. So ask your questions. I have a. Great question from Anne Elizabeth Moore, who asks, Sandy, can you talk a little bit about how girlhood emerges in your work and why you're drawn to the subject? Um, how girlhood, okay. Well, <laughs> I, I'm still writing, I'm still trying to write my way out of it, right? I'm still trying to grow up. And I feel like uh, making Shirkers, um, which was a story basically, um, of me exercising, exorcising things that happened to me in my teenage years um, was one way in which I was trying to grow up. And um, this novel, Lurkers, which has a few teenage girls in it, um, who you know both have, who feel like they 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 have a lot of power. They feel like they have a lot of power and agency. And then you see that they actually don't have as much agency as they think they do. Um, and that's such a, a state of, that's always in such a state of, you know, when you're a teenage girl, that's, that's always, um, it, you know, playing itself in your psyche all the time. You feel like you're not just a kid, you're wiser than that. But at the same time, the world sees you as a kid and um, people stronger and more devious than you see you as just a kid um, and, you know, might feel like they can do things to you. Um, so it was, it was working out a lot of those things in the book and um hopefully oh sadly well not no no hopefully <laughs> as I'm, I'm 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 preparing and hopefully doing the idiot which is also about a, a late 
teenager trying to grow up. Um, at some point in my life, I will outgrow this topic, but, but um, hopefully not for a little while yet. I hope so too. Anyway, we are at our last question and it's from Eleanor Louie. Okay. Who asks, it seems like you have a healthy appreciation for dark humor and dark topics. Would you imagine directing a horror movie? Um, why, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my, my first novel was, was in some ways, uh, it can be seen as a, as a horror novel. It can be seen as a supernatural novel, which is a nicer way of saying, a higher class way of saying a horror novel. Um, uh, but um, but I yeah, call it I, contem I'm, contemporary gothic. Yes, that is the most <laughs> high class way of calling that thing. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm quite interested in in um, suspense. I'm quite interested in in um, I don't know human fear and bad impulses, uh, and and it doesn't even require a supernatural element for it to 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 you know for for something to to be horror to me because uh, I find that that human beings often are the scariest things to each other. Um, and so, yes, I'm very, very interested in those kinds of, of heightened states of, of tension and emotion. And um, horror is, is, as a genre is a great way of, of capturing all of those things. So yeah, I, I, I definitely am interested in, in horror as a genre. I would never be considered, you know, I don't know, for, for something like that maybe, but, um, but definitely I, I am interested in these things. You never know. You never know. Anyway, this has been fantastic. Thank you for all your questions and thank you all for being here today. It's just, it's so much fun to talk to you and just really find out more. Um, yeah. And about, thank you, Kevin, yeah. for, for doing this thing. I, you know, yeah. I, I keep pulling you into these, these things and you, you agree and you're such a nice, nice, good sport. I mean, it's an absolute honor because I, I just love this book so much. And I just feel like, you know, everyone's going to love it. And I hope everyone shares you know, and spreads the word about how fantastic Lurkers is. And this is actually, frankly, I have to say, this is also an excuse for me to just talk to you. So thank <laughs> yeah, you for- Same here. For, yeah. Same here. Thank you both for this wonderful conversation. Kevin, that was like expert level moderation. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you all again for being here tonight for your questions and spending your evening with us. Please learn more about this incredible book and purchase Lurkers at harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good weekend. Keep reading and stay safe. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, everybody, for Thank showing you. up. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.